Final Labs reported their Q3 earnings for the fiscal year of 2024. In this video, let's talk about what was announced, what was guided for, and ultimately, what kind of impact it will have on a financial model. My name is Scott. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Consider subscribing, make sure you hit the notification bell. And if you're not new to the channel, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Let's get into it. To start things off, on November 11th, which would actually technically be the quarter that we're in now, Planet Labs launched 36 Super Doves, as well as their first Pelican tech demo with SpaceX on their Transporter 9 mission, which was on a Falcon 9 rocket. This marks their 33rd successful launch and their 569th satellite launched and deployed. And while Planet Labs has announced that the Pelican tech demo will not be revenue producing, they did mention that they are feeling good so far and that the first block in the fleet is currently in production. And now as far as how many are actually in this first block, it's anyone's guess at this point. The overall number of planned Pelicans is 32 in total. That includes the first tech demo, the one that just launched, as well as the second tech demo. So of the, I guess, 31 that are upcoming, my best guess is that they'd probably do about 10 in this first block, this first fleet. But like I said, your guess is as good as mine. On top of that, Planet Labs launched their new Forest Carbon product, as well as announced their first customer. All right, let's take a look at the guidance now. Rather than going over each of these point by point, essentially what I've done is I've transferred these over into the valuation model. So as you can see here, what I've done is I've added a note that keeps track of all the historic guidance that we've had throughout time. So as you can see here, it goes from the 2021 investor day of $298 million, and then you can kind of see the past four quarters that were guided for for the full fiscal year of the year 2024, the year that we're currently in, ending January 31st, 2024, as you can see up here. So at a glance, what was guided for in Q4, you can see it was revised downward in Q1, then revised downward again in Q2, and then in Q3, it more or less just tightened that range. So it brought it up by 2 million on either side. This is a little bit, um, I mean, more or less expected, but it does kind of contradict what was said. And I, and I know I keep banging the drum on like Q1 and Q2, but I mean, if you're going to be talking about how strong your pipeline is, it kind of contradicts that you're also guiding revenue downward. More specifically, I think it was in the Q1 or maybe the Q2 call, but they mentioned pipeline a number of times and they kept talking about these seven or eight figure deals in the pipeline. However, if we cross-reference this with the announcements that were actually made in, we'll go Q1, Q2, and Q3. What we can see here is there is, quote unquote, multiple greater than $1 million contract wins. So that would be one of those seven figure examples of what was in the pipeline. So multiple $1 million contract wins, we'll call that, I don't know what they mean by that, maybe, maybe three, maybe four. We'll call that $4 million. For Q2, we have a, a new seven figure, so we're at five overall now. Uh, another one over here, so six overall. And then most recently in the Q3, the one that was just posted, we have another seven figures here and another seven figures here. So all those combined, what are we at? We're at four, five, six, and we'll call that seven, eight. So over the past three quarters, and of course there's gonna be a lot of little tuck-ins here and there, but like, you know, five, six figure deals as well, but we haven't seen any of those eights. So in a nutshell, we're just looking at the seven figure deals that were announced. So if we have, let's just call it eight, seven figure deals, that's $8 million in total. And if we look at the full year for the, the year that we're in, fiscal year 2024, we're looking at a sum of, we'll call it $220 million. So what we can do here is we can simply divide eight by the 219. And you can see that despite these large wins, what can be identified for the upcoming full year is a percentage change of less than 4%. So it's not nothing, but it's something still worth considering. I want to see a lot more of those seven figure deals, or I'm not sure what's happening with those eight figure deals. I don't remember the exact number that they have mentioned in the past. I think it was five, five, eight figure deals in the pipeline. So all in all, I'm not sure exactly what percentage of the pipeline is actually being converted into revenue. So I figured it was probably beneficial to put revenue under a microscope. One thing that Planet Labs reports in their earnings is the what they call the diversified business mix. So essentially what this does is it takes the revenue and it divides it by geography and it also divides it by customer type. Now I'm not too worried about the geography for this particular uh, thought exercise, but what I have done is I've taken the percentages of the revenue split by customer type, compared it to the total revenue. And what that does is it just lands at the actual, the value of each of the customer types. The reason I wanted to do that 
is if we now scroll down to the bottom, we can actually see the growth rate for commercial, civil government, and defense and intelligence. So you can see that commercial is really what's taking the biggest hit. And it, when you compare civil government and defense and intelligence, you can see that these are actually growing at a very healthy pace for, for what is available, right? We don't have a, a large data set. Planet Labs hasn't been public for too, too long. But of what we do have, the most recent numbers anyways, it seems like if you were to just exclude uh, commercial revenue, Planet Labs would still be growing at a pretty healthy pace. And if we scroll back up, we can see that commercial is being eclipsed now by civil and by defense. So if civil and defense continue to grow at the rate that they have been, it will probably be a pretty decent upcoming year for Planet Labs. All that being said though, scrolling back down again, if we look at the overall revenue growth for the full year, what was um, projected for, we're only looking about 9%. So of course, what we're trying to identify using a financial model like this is where is the stock going to go? And a huge part of that is where's the revenue going to go and how's the rest of the business going to track? So in the last video that we made of Planet Labs, we had Planet Labs growing at 20%, but I'm not sure if that's entirely fair anymore. We'll know a lot more with the next quarterly release because they will give guidance for the upcoming next year and, and hopefully they'll be a little more conservative when they do guide for the, the full fiscal year of 2025 because they kind of shot themselves in the foot this past year, uh, kind of uh, frustrated a lot of investors, I'm sure. And ultimately, it's it's better to guide under and, and beat that to, to sandbag, right? That's kind of the ideal situation for what management should be doing. All right, so without going too much into detail for the rest of the financial model, if, if you're interested in really getting in the weeds, there's a, a previous video that was worth checking out. But all you need to know for this part is that the cost of revenue, the gross profit, the margin, I mean, everything really down to this point, these are all just formulas. And as you can see, what the number arrives at compared to what it's guided for is slightly conservative. Um, you'll notice that for research and development, I think that this number will be slightly lower than what we see here. And the reason for that is because there was a $2.3 million adjustment in relation to the acquisition of Synergize. So this number will be more likely to be around the $30 million mark but that is TBD. Two more things on the financial model. The first, we'll scroll down to the adjusted EBITDA. So again, this number here, this ends up being um, you know, a, a little bit more conservative. On top of that, they have reiterated yet again that they do plan to be uh, adjusted EBITDA profitable by Q4 of the fiscal year of 2025, which would be the calendar year of 2024. So if what they're saying is accurate by pretty much this time next year, they should be adjusted EBITDA profitable. We're going to scroll ahead a little bit, and as you can see, the numbers that I have, they don't become adjusted EBITDA profitable for pretty much like an extra year and a half. So my numbers are probably too conservative. I mean, they're obviously much more conservative than what management is guiding for. I think a large impact of that is the stock-based compensation. But as you can see, they've been doing a very good job at bringing that down. Virtually all of these decrease quarter over quarter, and that's the relationship that hopefully we continue to see over time. Last but not least, there was a slight adjustment that was made to CapEx. The reason for that is generally when companies are talking about CapEx, what they're simply meaning is the line from the cash flow statement, which is the purchase of property, plant, and equipment. Some companies in, in Planet Lab's case, they'll add other uh, metrics to that. So ultimately what we were doing previously was we were just using the purchases of property and equipment. But what I realized is they are actually including the capitalized internal use software. So this has been slightly adjusted. And as a result, free cash flow will be slightly adjusted, but it's not by a large margin. As you can see, previously it would have been 7.3. Now it's going to be 8.6. It's not nothing, but it's, it's worth mentioning the, the CapEx formula has been updated. So finally, what we're going to do is we're going to circle back to revenue. I think that maybe the 20% is a little bit too optimistic. Uh, maybe not long term, but what we're going to do just to compare the previous price targets to this video here that we're making now is we're going to just bump this down to 15%. Um, real quick, I'm going to bring up the old Planet Labs model. Just got to find it quick. This is the Planet Labs model from the previous video. This is not the one that we were just talking about that was updated. The long term, the 2023 price target was previously around the $11.5 mark. And after these adjustments from in the, in the new model here, we're looking around the $8.75 mark. So it's still a 275% increase, assuming all goes well, but that's assuming all goes well. 
Also, I'm going to hop back to the other one as well because of the CapEx adjustment. Uh, what were we doing? So 25 for the payback price. Again, this is the old model, uh, 25 again. So what is that jumps from? It was previously 12.2 and now is closer to 10. And it actually is more a little more in line with the, um, with the other two price targets. So that's beneficial, if anything. I suppose now, now that we're here as well, because this number is a little bit higher, maybe it is fair that we adjust this to lower than 25%. That goes for the, the price to earnings growth share price, which is essentially the, the earnings. Maybe these, these do get lowered, but um, I'm not gonna play around with it too much. If, if you really wanna get into the, into the weeds with it, it's, it's available in the, the link below the video here. So if you're the more curious type, you can make these adjustments for yourself and ultimately find your own price target, so to speak. And um, if you haven't seen the last video as well, all of these, every single dark gray cell on the right hand side can be adjusted manually. So, I mean, virtually every single parameter that you think could be updated or needs to be updated, you can you know feel free to do it on your own and ultimately it will give you a price target based on the formulas below that are either based on earnings, based on the overall um, growth of the business or based on free cash flow. All right, so now that we've gone through the updates to the valuation model, what I wanted to do is share an idea with you that I had for a previous video. So I put everything together, but I ultimately realized that the video was either going to be way too long and kind of dry or way too short. And ultimately what I decided is to go with quality over quantity I decided to scrap the video and just kind of talk it into the video that you're seeing now. I went through everyone on the board of directors. I put, as you can see, all the names are on the left hand side, the designation and the organization that they were affiliated with. The overall idea of what I was putting together was if you were to simply invest in the board of directors, what kind of returns would you get? As you can imagine, this is a little bit tricky to put together, but and ultimately it's like I could go point by point over every single person, every single designation, every single organization, but I mean, that would be quite dry. And I'm saying that as someone who runs a channel that's basically talking about math. So rather than going point by point over every single person in every single designation. I've listed it all here. I mean, if you are, th this is just one of the sheets that's in the valuation model. So if you are, for whatever reason, interested in the board of directors and what they've done, where they've been, how long for, et cetera, it's all there. I've taken the time frames that each individual in Planet Labs' board of directors was within the company. What I did from there is I found the ticker for each of these companies as long as they were public. From there, looked at the start date and end date. So whether it's from the moment that they started the company or whether the company um, went public or if the company was acquired or if the person left the company, for example. But essentially what I've done is look at the month by month change for each person. So like, again, just assuming that you're investing them blindly from the moment that they start the company to the moment, from the moment that you're able to, to the moment that you're not able to with each person, with each company. As you can see, this number on the right hand side is what we're looking for. Um, this is the average monthly change per uh, organization for each person. Scroll down all the way to the bottom. And what we can arrive at is the combined average monthly change. So what this does is it takes every one of those companies that I've, that I've mentioned, divides it to find an average. And what we can do from there is we can find the annualized change. So essentially, this is the number that we ultimately arrive at. So taking that 12.9%, what we can do is we can compare it with the average historical return of the NASDAQ, which would be, I, I think, a more fair to compare Planet Labs to the NASDAQ than to the S&P 500, for example. NASDAQ is generally a little more tech oriented. So if you look at the past five or 10 years, Planet Labs board of directors would be underperforming the, the NASDAQ 100. And if you look at the 30 year average return for the NASDAQ, the Planet Labs board of directors would be slightly overperforming. So like I mentioned, when I put everything together, it didn't seem really enough substance to be its own video, but it was a nice tuck in for um, the video you're watching now. So take that information for what you will. To wrap things up, not the best earnings from Planet Labs, but it also wasn't terrible. I'm really curious to see how the next year is going to shape up. And more specifically, I'm curious to see what they're gonna guide for when the next earnings comes out. If you got value from this video, please leave a thumbs up. Thank you guys for the hangout and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.